case. Well, what about preservation? Has God preserved the Bible? Sometimes people will say, well, maybe the Bible is God's word when it was originally given, but since then there have been so many copies, so many translations, so many changes, that now we just can't believe what it says. We really, you know, it was God's word when it was written. Yeah, sure, fine, but, but what about now? I mean, now, I mean, who knows? I mean, we don't know where it is. We don't know if God, we have the words of God anymore. Well, we can be thankful that the Bible not only claims to be God's word, but it claims that God would preserve it. And we're going to see that that's what it claims, and we're going to see there's evidence, great evidence for that as well. So, for example, Psalm 12, verses 6 and 7 state, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So here we have a statement that, uh, the pure words that God gave by inspiration, God would preserve those very words forever. We can also see that in Matthew 24 and verse 35. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 35. The Bible says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. So here, uh, Christ's words would not pass away. We looked earlier at Matthew 5 and verse 18 where the Bible says, till heaven and earth pass, one jot, smallest Hebrew consonant, one tittle, you know, like a little dot and an I, shall not in any wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So not even a single letter, uh, God says, would be lost. Every single letter, every single word, every single consonant, every single vowel would be preserved. And this, is re- this makes sense, because since Matthew 4, 4, which you saw earlier, says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. If we're supposed to live by every one of those words, we need to be able to know where they are. Uh, They need to be available to us. They need to be accessible. Um, And if they were all lost or corrupted, then we obviously couldn't live by them. And we can see that uh, many texts also promise that those words that God inspired would be preserved and available to the people of God. So, for example, here uh, promising um, uh, believers here, it says, As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth, shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, thy descendants, nor out of the mouth of thy seed's seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. So here, uh, the words of God would be available to the people of God. They'd be in their mouths, uh, being passed down, spoken about, talked about, thought about, um, passed on from generation to generation. So, the Bible teaches that all of God's inspired words will be preserved forever and that they'll be available to those who want to live by them. And when you read uh, the Bible in the uh, King James Bible, that's an accurate translation of those preserved words in the Greek uh, and Hebrew uh, text. The Greek textus receptus is the term for that in the Hebrew Masoretic text. And you actually are holding in your hand a copy of um, the preserved word of God, accurately translated into English. So that's actually, uh, we can be thankful for that, that that's what God promises. Now, uh, is this confirmed by history? Is there good evidence for us to believe that God has preserved the Bible like he claimed? Well, there's actually fantastic evidence for that. The Bible is by far the best attested document of antiquity. We have over 5,600 known Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. We have over 10,000 Latin manuscripts, the Latin translation. And we have over 9,300 copies of other early versions, including the Ethiopic, the Slavic, the Armenian, the Syriac, Peshitta, the Buharic, the Arabic, the Old Latin, the Anglo-Saxon, Gothic, Sogdian, Old Syriac, Persian, and Frankish versions. So we have tons and tons of manuscript evidence here, a total of over 24,000 manuscript copies or portions. Uh, The book with the second largest number of copies, and that's, that's by far the largest of any ancient document. The second largest number would actually be Homer's Iliad, and Homer's Iliad has only a small fraction of the number of copies that the Bible has. So the Bible is way more than any other book of ancient history. Furthermore, New Testament manuscripts date back to the very era of the composition of the books themselves. A number of the papyri from the Qumran caves where the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered these early biblical manuscripts, date to as early as AD 50, and New Testament papyri from other locations date to close to AD 100, So, which is very shortly after the time that the New Testament books were written. In contrast to this uh, vast number of manuscripts dating back to the very time of the composition of the New Testament, the earliest 
uh, complete preserved text of Homer's Iliad dates to the 13th century AD. So huge gap for Homer, very, very small gap for the Bible. And in fact, even if somehow somebody were able to take these thousands of manuscripts from all over the world and just get rid of them all, we could actually reproduce the entire New Testament except for 11 of the 7,957 verses in the New Testament simply from the 36,289 quotes uh, from early church writers in Christendom from the 2nd to the 4th century. So even if somebody got rid of all the manuscripts, we could reproduce the whole thing just from quotes uh, from um, 36,289 quotes. So very, very good evidence for the New Testament being preserved, uh, way more than any other ancient document. And we have similar sort of evidence for the Old Testament as well. For example, in the uh, synagogue in Cairo, um, in the Cairo Synagogue Geniza, which was a storehouse for manuscripts, discovered in the 1890s, there were over 10,000 manuscript portions there. We have over 6,000 other Hebrew manuscripts from a wide variety of sources that uh, validate the Old Testament. In 1947, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, and these were a great opportunity to test the validity of the biblical promises of preservation. Uh, these manuscripts that were of Old the Old Testament discovered in the region of the Dead Sea, or in Israel, were about a thousand years or more older than any previous Old Testament manuscripts that had been discovered. So if the Bible had been corrupted, this would be the proof right here. All of a sudden, now we can go back a thousand years earlier. Well, let's see, is the text a thousand years earlier the same as the text a thousand years later? Or did it get changed? Is it completely different? Well, um, the Dead Sea Scrolls provided a fantastic confirmation of the authenticity of the Old Testament. Uh, the Hebrew manuscript, uh, Hebrew Masoretic text, which underlies the, the King James Bible and most other uh, Bible versions, was found in the scrolls. So the Bible has not been changed. Uh, other early manuscripts found in other locations, such as uh, the fortress of Masada in Israel, also evidence the accuracy of the Hebrew text. For example, uh, they have fragments there from the book of Psalms, Leviticus, Ezekiel, and Deuteronomy that were letter by letter identical to the printed Hebrew text that you would get if you went to a bookstore and bought a Hebrew Old Testament. So here we have fantastic accuracy for the Old and New Testament. And they were very, very careful in making copies of the Bible, both because God had promised that the Bible be preserved and also because a lot of these scribes were respecting the Bible as God's word. So, for example, here we have, I'm going to bring up here a picture for you. So... This is a copy of uh, the Old Testament here. This is, um, where did I put it down? This is a copy from the Qumran Caves of Genesis, okay? A fragment there from the Qumran Caves uh, dating to about A.D. 50, okay? And so here we have this copy from A.D. 50. And then here we have uh, Codex L, which dates to 1008 A.D., it's uh, a very uh, important Old Testament manuscript a thousand years later. And so uh, this early copy, uh, 4Q2 from uh, AD 50, and uh, here the copy from 1000 AD, uh, guess how many letters are different? How many consonants are different in those two texts? Zero. Exactly the same text. And the one, the copy from AD 50 and 1000 AD. Looks like God's preserving it, doesn't it? Um, how about the New Testament here? This here, uh, we have here a, one of the earliest uh, fragments of the, old, the New Testament here, dating to uh, 90 to 125 AD. And this early, um, early copy here um, has sections of the Bible, of the New Testament. And then this uh, early copy, if you compare it to the... Uh, printed uh, New Testament that we have today, it's actually exactly the same text again from uh, the, this papyrus fragment from um, the first about 100 AD to um, printed New Testament today, exactly the same text. And in fact, you all, we also have other copies that are like that as well. So for example, here, we, uh, I'm just going to uh, you can look at these if you really want to. You could find somebody that reads ancient manuscripts and validate that this is the truth. But here we have uh, four copies. This is manuscript 1072 from Mount Athos in Greece, from the book of Titus. This is the whole book of Titus here in the New Testament. 
And um, then we have manuscript 2080 here. This is from um, the Isle of Patmos. This is again the book of Titus. And then here we have a third manuscript here. This is uh, from manuscript 2587 from uh, the Vatican Library. Okay, so here's manuscript 2587. This is manuscript 2723 uh, from another city in Greece, uh, uh, Tricola. And again, the book of Titus. And these manuscripts of the book of Titus made uh, centuries apart from each other in different parts of the world are exactly letter for letter identical despite being made in different centuries and they're unrelated uh, manuscripts. It's not like somebody sent the one copy to all four places. Unrelated manuscripts, centuries apart, uh, and they're identical. So we're not saying that there's never any scribe anywhere that didn't mess up one particular manuscript of the Bible, something like that. We're not saying that. But we can see that God did indeed preserve the words of the Bible, and uh, there was fantastic accuracy in their copying practices so that we can have this uh, fantastically accurate preservation of the Bible. Uh, really, in light of the fact that there are more uh, New Testament manuscripts than any other ancient document, in light of this kind of fantastically accurate copying practice, if you want to say that the Bible is not preserved, you have to say nothing is preserved. You have to throw out everything in ancient history because we have more copies of the Bible uh, by far and closer to the time written than we have of uh, Herodotus, of Thucydides, of Tacitus, of Pliny, uh, of basically everybody that lived back then, way more, more than Aristotle, more than Plato, uh, more than uh, Homer. So if you want to throw the Bible out so it's not preserved, you have to throw everything out. Um, if you don't want to pay that price, then the Bible is preserved. The Jews also had very, very amazing uh, practices when they would copy the Bible. They would actually um, be extremely, extremely accurate in doing it. So, for example, uh, if you got a, uh, here's, they had these different rules when they would copy uh, Hebrew manuscripts written in the Jewish Talmud. Uh, rule number one was to write no word or letter from memory, but to have an authentic copy before him and read and pronounce each word before writing it. Another rule they had was they had to finish a scroll within 30 days. Otherwise, the work was worthless. If there was one mistake on a sheet, that sheet was condemned. If there were three copying mistakes on any page, the entire manuscript was condemned, and they started over. Uh, every word and every letter was counted, and if a letter was omitted, an extra letter inserted, or if one letter touched another, the manuscript was condemned and destroyed at once. So, wow, <laughs> that's pretty amazing. And so if you look at the uh, Hebrew Old Testament, if you look at the end, there are these notes by the copyists, by the scribes, by the master rites. So, for example, at the end of the book of Genesis, here's a translation of part of the note. It said, the number of the verses of the book of Genesis is 1,534. And its middle point is, and by the sword shall thou live, 2740. And the words are 20,612. And the letters are 8 and 70,060 and 4. <laughs> so they counted every word, every verse, uh, and they knew what the middle points were. This is, they're very careful about this. I mean, they're, they're taking this copying stuff very seriously. At the end of the first five books of the Bible, there's another note. So here's at the end of the first five books, this is, there's a note that says this. The number of the verses of the whole law is 5,845. And its middle point is, and he placed on the breastplate the Urim and the Thummim, which is Leviticus 8.8. 8. The number of all the words is 81,440. The number of all the letters is 304,807. Wow. <laughs> so they're counting the number of letters, counting the number of words. Very, very careful. God is preserving the word. Okay. God kept his promise. It's intellectually very, very reasonable to believe God preserved the Bible. And to say that he didn't is you'd have to throw out all of ancient history. So the Bible is God's inspired word and the Bible is God's preserved word. Well, what about how do we know we have the right books of the Bible? Somebody said, well, maybe, you know, wasn't there... You know, how do we know that the books, you know, he said there's 66 books in here, um, for 40 different authors. How do we know those are the books? How do we know it's not some other books? Well, the books of the Bible were received by God's people right away and recognized as inspired. So, for example, uh, the book of uh, the Pentateuch talks about Moses getting the law from God coming down from Mount Sinai with the law. The people of Israel didn't say, you know what, Moses, we really don't know about this law. We're, we're going to wait 
a thousand years until there's some church council or something, and then we're going to see what they say. They knew that it was God's word right away. It was pretty obvious that this was God's word that Moses is bringing down. And that's actually the pattern for all the books. So, for example, in John 17, verse 8, Christ is praying for believers, and he says, For I have given unto them the words which thou, God the Father, gave me, and they have received them, and have known surely that it came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. So here, Christ prays that true believers receive uh, the words of Scripture right away. And that is was fulfilled. We can see that uh, throughout the Old and New Testament. So, for example, in uh, the book of Daniel, uh, Daniel and Jeremiah were contemporary Old Testament prophets. And here Daniel says, In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So Jeremiah had predicted that Jerusalem would be uh, desolate for seven years, 70 years. And so Jeremiah and Daniel are contemporaries, and Daniel is fully well aware that Jeremiah's book is God's word, that the book of Jeremiah existed, that it was the word of the Lord. So here we see um, contemporaries, they knew that the books of the Bible were God's word. They didn't need to wait for somebody to tell them hundreds of years later, some kind of conspiracy of the government or something. They knew it was God's word right away. Same thing with the New Testament. Uh, If you take a look, for example, at 1 Timothy 5 and verse 18, this is a letter of the Apostle Paul, the New Testament Apostle Paul, and he is writing this letter here in um, the middle of the first century. And it says, For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. So what's the significance here? Well, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. That's a quotation from the book of Deuteronomy, the part of the Old Testament written by Moses. So 1,400 years earlier, that was, uh, and Paul recognizes the books of Moses as scripture, as all the Jews did in his day. But what about the second part here? The laborer is worthy of his reward. He says that's scripture too. What's this? This is the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10 and verse 7. And Luke had been written very, very shortly before this epistle, this letter of the Apostle Paul had been written. So Paul here calls this contemporary New Testament Gospel scripture equal to the books of Moses written 1,400 years later, universally recognized by the Jews. So here we can see that they received the Gospel of Luke right away. They knew that it was God's word right away, equal to the earlier parts of the Bible. They didn't need to wait for some counsel to tell them. The true believers knew that it was God's word right away. We have other examples of this too. Um, Revelation 22, 18 and 19 says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So here we have very serious judgments on anybody that would add or take away from the book of Revelation. Now, um, if I wrote a book and somebody took a page out of it, I wouldn't like it very much, but I wouldn't say, you are not going to be in the holy city. You're not going to go to heaven. You're going to be going to hell. Uh, You're going to have horrible plagues from God uh, because you took a page out of my book. Um, It's not something I would say. So obviously, uh, John knew that he was writing by inspiration. He knew these were God's words, and if you mess with these words, you're messing with, with God's words. So he knew that, and the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3 that he was writing to knew that as well. They received the words of the book of Revelation as scripture right away. They didn't need to wait for whatever to happen before they knew that it was God's word. One more example, 2 Peter chapter 3. Here, the apostle Peter and Paul are contemporaries, right? And this is what Peter says about the apostle Paul in his writings. It says, an account of the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. Even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. So Paul wrote to the same group of people that here Peter is writing to. And he says, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, twist, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. So here, notice that the apostle Peter calls Paul's writings scripture. So he's calling, and and there's already this canonical collection, this inspired collection of Paul's epistles. He calls them all his epistles. So there's a canonical collection, there's a collection of all Paul's epistles, which are recognized as inspired scripture, equal to all the other scriptures, during Peter's lifetime, and Paul's lifetime. 
So we can see from these examples and many others that the books of the Bible were received, recognizes God's word right away. Um, and that was what happened. So the Bible is inspired. The Bible is preserved. The Bible is uh, canonical. It was received by God's people right away. So what conclusion can we draw from all this? Well, we've seen over the course of this Bible study that the Bible claims that it's the inspired word of God. Uh, it claims to be just as much God's word as if you actually audibly heard God speaking out loud to you. And so the Bible isn't just God's word in some kind of vague, general sense, but each and every one of its words is from God. We then saw some of the powerful evidence backing up this fact, and we saw as well that God has promised to preserve his words until today, and he has kept that promise. So in light of those facts, what should we do? Well, 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So we need to be diligent to to study the word of God, to understand it, to rightly interpret it, rightly divide it. In John 5.39, the Bible says, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. So we need to search them. We need to study them again. Um, And as we do so, we need to have the attitude of the psalmist here. Psalm 19, 7 through 11. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and keeping them is great reward. So the Bible is a priceless treasure that God has given to us. It's the most important book that we have in all existence. So we should then see what the Bible says about who God is. We should see, learn about the most important being, and that will be study number two. So we're going to take a little quiz here, see if you learned anything. All right. Boy, I'm going to get a quiz. Yeah, you sure are. Here we go. All right. So here we have some true false questions for you. See if you can answer them. All right. Now, and now, they're true-false, so you would have a 50% chance, but hopefully, um, you know, it's not just that. Okay, here we go. Question one. The Bible is a good religious book, but it has some minor errors in it since it was written by man. True or false? Hmm. That is false. The Bible is infallible. It has no errors. And it was written by human being, written down, but the all-powerful God is perfectly capable of using fallible people to write a perfect book. And just like we would write with a pen, God uh, used human pens, as it were, to write down his very words. So this first question, the answer is false. Two, every word of the Bible is as much God's word as if the Lord actually spoke it directly to you out loud. True or false? False. That is true. That is exactly what God's word is. Number three. Words in the Bible are in italics to show that they are important, to emphasize them. True or false? That is false. Remember, we said that the words in italics are there because the King James Version is a very literal translation of the Bible. And so... It has words in it that are italicized because those are words that we need in English, but there's not a specific word in the Greek or Hebrew that where it's literally passing that word into the English language. Those are words that are implied in the Greek or Hebrew, but they're not specifically stated. Like we gave the illustration of Proverbs 35 and 6. Every there's a Hebrew word for every, there's a Hebrew word for word, there's Hebrew for of God, there's a Hebrew for pure, but the word is is implied in the Hebrew text, not specifically stated, so they put it in italics. So that question there, uh, the italics are not for emphasis. Those are words that we need to supply in English that are implied in the Hebrew syntax or Greek syntax, but aren't specifically there. Number four, science, archaeology, and history all confirm that the Bible is true. True or false? Hmm. 
That's true. Yeah, true. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's very intellectually reasonable to believe the Bible. Actually, I think uh, anybody who is honest in studying it, you actually can't be intellectually honest and reject the Bible. Great evidence for the Bible. Number five. There is more historical evidence that the text of the Bible has been preserved than there is for any other ancient document. True or false? That's true. If you want to say that the Bible has not been preserved, you have to throw out every other document of ancient history. There's more for the Bible. 24,000 copies of ancient Greek manuscripts, ancient uh, translations for the New Testament, thousands and thousands for the Old Testament. Great evidence for the Bible. Six, the main reason that some people do not believe the Bible is because there is not enough evidence for it. True or false? Hmm. That is false. Um, the main reason people, some people don't believe the Bible is because they don't want to believe the Bible. It's fundamentally a moral issue, not an intellectual one. I mean, that isn't to say that, you know, if somebody's heard this or that and he hasn't taken the time to study it out, he might, you know, believe things. But uh, maybe he should take the time to study it out. Maybe that's a moral issue, too. He'd rather spend his time on doing other stuff than finding out whether the Bible is true. Uh, number seven, we must reverently study the Bible since every one of its words is inspired by God and preserved by him for us today. True or false? That is true. So, uh, hopefully, study number one is a blessing to you. I encourage you, again, to look up those verses in the Bible. We have those resources at faithsaves.net that give more evidence, more depth on some of these other things. Uh, also, uh, if you need a physical copy of the Bible, um, you don't have one, and you want somebody to come study the Bible with you, at faithsaves.net slash church dash directory, you can find a directory of Bible-believing and practicing churches, get somebody to come uh, meet with you, and give you more evidence, uh, give you a copy of the Bible, study the Bible with you, go through these studies one-on-one -on -one with you in person. So, um, thank you for taking the time to watch this. I'd encourage you to go on and uh, watch study number two uh, soon. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we're thankful for the time we've had to look at this study of the most important book, uh, the Bible, and for these truths that we've learned about God's word, that we've learned that it's inspired, we've learned that it's preserved, we've seen a lot of the great evidence for it, and I pray that you would encourage everyone that watches this video to have confidence in the Bible as your very word, your self-attesting and fallible word, which is exactly what it is, and that they would see uh, what that means about who you are and what that means about who they are and what they need to do as these Bible studies go on. We pray this, these things for Jesus' sake. Amen. <music>